Okay, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, nice to see this many people here. Uh, my name is Kimmo Kuisma and uh, I work as a designer at Media Cabinet. By the way, uh, can you still hear me alright? Alright. The topic for today is uh, responsive web design. And uh, here's a sort of a summary of uh, what we're going to cover today. I'd like to start by uh, looking at the backgrounds to web design from print to uh, what's now called uh, OneWeb. Then uh, jump into looking at responsive design basics. And uh, I'm not going to go too deep into it technically. Just, uh, just the basics really. And then we're going to look at the workflow. How that is different from uh, what you might be used to if you're uh, doing designs in Photoshop or something similar. And then uh, in the end some thoughts about or a summary about responsive web design. And as I said, the uh, technical side is going to be uh, really basic and sort of uh, oversimplified. So you should read on more on that online because uh, I don't see any point in uh, repeating a manual here. And it's going to be more of a focused on the why part of doing responsive design. And I'll try to fit this. Uh, whole responsive design thing uh, sort of into the big picture of design. So uh, uh, first a little poll. Uh, how, how many of you know uh, what responsive design uh, generally is or, or have you implemented a responsive design? Okay, quite a few. Uh, how many of you uh, admit to being uh, graphic designers? A lot less. Okay, do you uh, create your designs in Photoshop. Okay. And you write your HTML and CSS yourself too? Okay. Well, I hope I can uh, change your way of thinking even a little bit with this. So let's uh, start looking back a little bit. So as many of you might know, web design has its roots uh, really deep in uh, print design world. And something called the dot-com boom happened in the 90s when uh, all of a sudden all designers uh, were started to be hired into uh, digital design jobs uh, in web and uh, pretty much every company uh, had to be online. They wanted to appear modern and competitive. So that was uh, sort of the birth of uh, what we now call des desktop design. So what happened uh, was that designers took uh, the tools that they were using at the time. They took those over and uh, they didn't really consider if this was a good move or not. And this is uh, something that st uh, still shows in uh, terminology when we're talking about design. Uh, for example, uh, terms in uh, typographic uh, letting, tracking, typeface font, then we got sort of structural terms like grid gutter, columns, we have white space. So those are all uh, pretty much relics uh, from that era. <clears throat> so the question is, we uh, ch uh, suddenly changed the mediums. Uh, shouldn't we adapt the uh, tools and our skill set too? And uh, we really need to find reasons uh, why this change happened the way it did. Or is it the designers themselves or the medium that caused this uh, sort of mismatch? So uh, this is something uh, based on my uh, personal experience with uh, friends and knowing a lot of designers. Uh, we're all sort of uh, control freaks in a good and constructive way. Uh, we love uh, putting structure to everything. Uh, design grids, we like consistencies and color theories, all types of hierarchies and typography. And uh, as Jeff Ravine has put it, that good designers can create normalcy out of chaos. So that's what we're doing in our jobs every day. And it becomes uh, second nature for us really easily. So when we jumped over to uh, web design, we took the tools over and uh, it was a really natural move. It offered us uh, 
like easier learning curves and uh, no new process system master. All the workflows uh, seem familiar. And uh, when you opened up a document in a Photoshop or created a new one, it still looked pretty similar to uh, what you were used to in uh, Quark Express or some other publishing program. The concept was the same, the design was fixed, that was the starting point. And uh, designers really didn't touch the uh, technical stuff at first. Uh, we had developers who sliced the designs for us and uh, it was really a convenient move for us, jumping from uh, one medium to another. Then uh, all of a sudden a uh, mobile phone started appearing. They had uh, web browsing capabilities. And uh, back we had uh, only one design target, to it. that was the desktop. Now we had two different targets that were uh, really like separate. And we had to start paying attention to all these new things like uh, slower transfer rates, uh, display resolutions that were really small and different, and uh, everybody was using their, their uh, devices when they were moving out and about. So this was the designer's response. They assumed that the use cases and scenarios for uh, mobile use, that they were different than what they were in desktop environment, and they were, uh, at those times, they were really uh, correct about that. So for example, uh, people used uh, their phones to check timetables, phone numbers, finding directions from maps or sending and reading messages. And this was kind of a landmark for the birth of a mobile site. And uh, mobile, so was, mobile site was really made to support these uh, use cases that were really short in duration. And they were, uh, when you took a project, you had a desktop design project, then you had a mobile uh, site design project, so uh, they were uh, really separate designs. And uh, when you open a mobile site, a dedicated mobile site in a desktop browser, this is what happens. I don't think it's uh, a very good user experience. It's, uh, these mobile sites are usually uh, more limited in content. Uh, compared to the desktop sites. They don't scale, scale that well. They've got some, uh, a lot of times, some uh, magical mobile width that's supposed to be shared by all the uh, devices. And they're tucked away under different subdomains like uh, mobile.something.com or even a different top level domain like .mobi. Then we move to uh, the current situation where the uh, mobile use cases, they're pretty much dead because uh, mobile devices are used for everything now. Even uh, there's a lot of people, I can't remember the statistics, but there's a lot of people who use their mobile devices for everything, uh, including uh, entertainment usage, like watching movies and so on. So the range of uh, device classes and individual devices is like climbing rapidly all the time. And as a consequence, you can imagine what that does to the uh, number of design targets that we'd have to hit if we were doing design the uh, traditional way. This is an image showing uh, Android fragmentation. There's uh, currently over 4,000 different Android devices from uh, all the major manufacturers and all the devices have some sort of quirks or features of their own different resolutions and so on. So here's a question. Would you like to do separate designs even for uh, those device classes? And I'm not talking about individual uh, devices. It seems uh, really impractical to me. There needs to be a better solution uh, for solving this issue. So the outcome is this. If we keep designing one device or a device class at a time, it's going to be expensive, slow, and impractical. The uh, uh, one good thing that has always come out of this uh, is sales. I mean, uh, salespeople can uh, generate new projects and 
new silos for individual project and uh, they keep on trying to hit one target at a time but that's not something that you want to base your design on at this point it's uh, good to look at what the uh, canvas actually is that designers and all types of artists use when we look at the uh, uh, traditional canvases it's uh, always been fixed artists have relied on uh, a printed piece of paper a block of stone or wood or magazine page something like that to uh, do their designs on and whatever they create it's uh, constrained by the fixed dimensions of that medium doesn't matter what you do to a piece of a magazine it's still going to be a, the same page pretty much so compared to a browser viewport which in my opinion is a kind of a living canvas it's uh, something that any user can uh, manipulate as they please and uh, an HTML document it's it's just an abstraction layer between the designer and the canvas it's something that we used to create with but it's not the actual canvas that we're uh, working on a guy called uh, John Alsop already had this idea in uh, 12 years ago in, he said this in a book called uh, Dao of Web Design uh, which is available on a list apart. I think the article is there too that we should embrace the fact that the web doesn't have the same constraints as the printed medium and base always uh, base our designs on this uh, flexibility. So uh, clearly our understanding of what design is is growing uh, but pretty slowly and we're uh, becoming more flexible in how we approach uh, design problems. How many of you have uh, heard the uh, princi principle called uh, one web? Okay, two people. <laughs> the uh, basic premise is uh, pretty simple. It's that web needs to be open to everybody and same rules should up apply to everybody so we should uh, it doesn't matter who you are or what device you're using or what kind of a browser you're using what kind of a connection you got whether it's slow or fast or what kind of information the service contains uh, it should make no difference and uh, instead of creating applications that you download and install we should uh, try to focus on creating experiences that are like freely available to everybody so uh, uh, with this principle we're pretty much trying to re uh, get rid of the thinking that we need device silos that we have a mobile site we have a uh, desktop site we have a tablet site and so on there's a really heated debate going uh, over this issue between uh, two camps. The proponents, uh, who are usually the people uh, who are vouching for HTML5, they're saying that uh, OneWeb is the right way. There's no installations uh, or no app stores to worry about. And the opponents are saying that, of course, native apps perform a lot better. And they have better API support and app stores and safety which is partly true if you think about the uh, the number of viruses for example in the uh, Android app store the Android market but HTML5 is sort of turning the tide in favor uh, of the proponents in this idea because uh, of the device uh, APIs they're getting a uh, worked on all the time and they're uh, getting gradually better they're uh, bridging the gap between uh, 
the native apps than the HTML apps, and we're going to reach a point where uh, performance and pretty much everything is uh, identical, or uh, at least almost identical between the two. So we're getting stuff like uh, camera APIs, file system APIs, geolocation APIs, and we can ac access everything, all of that with uh, JavaScript. And this sort of makes the uh, opponents a strong argument really void. And uh, something that you might want to think about, if you've got a nice uh, lucrative business idea, uh, would you rather build one application that's really available to everybody? Or do you want to platform lock out those uh, people? Uh, if you build an uh, application, native application, do you want to platform lock out all the other people who are using different devices? All, uh, or uh, alternatively, uh, do you want to spend more money on uh, creating native applications for all the uh, major platforms? So um, now we're getting into the actual responsive web design. First, I'd like to uh, take a look at something uh, that has influenced this uh, concept a lot before it was sort of uh, moved over into uh, web design, and that's uh, architecture. There's uh, some uh, modern architects who've tried uh, experimenting with uh, physical spaces that adapt to uh, behavior of people. For example, when you walk into a room and all of a sudden it starts getting crowded there, the walls sort of expand and make more, more uh, room in there. Uh, there might be glasses that turn, uh, like window panes that turn transparent or uh, opaque when needed. For example, if you need privacy, you can just use the same glasses. No curtains needed. <laughs> And there's uh, climate and lighting controls based on the uh, number of people currently in the room. And the key to uh, all these uh, implementations behind them is uh, that there's only one design. And I would have showed a video here, but it's going to be a bit difficult. If you want, you can uh, check on YouTube for uh, responsive architecture or smart glass. There's some uh, uh, pretty cool videos about that. Okay, uh, responsive web design earlier had a bit of a bad name. It was being called a buzzword a lot. But the idea is uh, slowly starting to uh, become uh, more widely accepted. And it, it, in my opinion, it is uh, the next step forward in the evolution of web design. So, uh, what we're seeing is, here is uh, we're moving away from our uh, print design roots and uh, trying to embrace the web more freely. And we really uh, should uh, try to focus on uh, the same philosophies that those uh, architects are following. The, uh, the old way of doing things isn't really uh, the most dynamic way to uh, move forward. This is the uh, legendary quote from uh, Etha Marquardt, who was the guy who uh, wrote the first article about responsive web design and basically uh, introduced the whole concept to web design. What is, uh, in short, what he's saying is that we need to treat all the devices as different aspects of the same experience instead of trying to create multiple uh, experiences uh, device by device. And if you've got a, a mobile phone or a tablet or something, uh, try the uh, URL. It's a small demo site. I can show it from here too. Yeah. 
it's a bit difficult because I can't use the uh, uh, screen on the laptop. But this is basically a, a typical implementation. How many, how many of you got something that you can browse with at the moment? Okay, quite a lot. Just uh, give it a try. I'll uh, move back one slide and uh, here's the URL. I'm not going to show it there because it's, it just gets uh, really complicated with this setup. But when, when you go there, if you've got a laptop or something that you can use to resize the design with, and try uh, resizing the browser viewport and see how it uh, affects the design. And feel free to uh, play around with it, dig into the code. I'll probably uh, put this uh, online as a zip file after this lecture so uh, you can examine it uh, a bit further if you want to. So uh, responsive web design in a nutshell, it's about creating one design that adapts, uh, resizes and uh, reorders itself and its elements based on uh, device features. And as already mentioned, it was coined by Ethan Marcotte in 2010, so it's still a relatively new concept. And it's uh, not a single technique. It's a really loose and a big collection of uh, different philosophies, techniques, and elements. And uh, we're going to look at the uh, most basic ones next. So here they are. These are the basic building blocks that you'll be running into in uh, every design project that, you're, uh, that uses responsive design. So we have uh, media queries, and we have fluid grids and uh, fluid images. Uh, what media queries uh, solve is uh, how can we detect the features from devices that is currently using the design. For example, we can uh, find out if the device has a retina display or if it's in landscape orientation, or if the width of the viewport is more or more than 960 pixels, and so on. There's a really lost, uh, long list of uh, features that you can detect, but the ones that you run into most often are uh, things that have to do with uh, resolution, such, uh, such as uh, viewport width or height or orientation, and then again, uh, pixel density. And they're uh, constantly being worked on. Uh, they're creating new ideas for new types of uh, media queries. Here's the, uh, the, ana the ana anatomy of uh, a media query. You can uh, really split them into two parts. The first part is the media type. Then you have a connector, and you have the expression. And uh, for connectors, you can use AND, and you can use, use an OR too, but the OR is uh, actually a comma-separated list of uh, those expressions, so there is no actual OR word. And you can chain these uh, as much as you like, basically. But it's uh, always a good idea to use common sense when uh, creating this. Some examples. This is uh, from a CSS file. We're creating a block that only applies to uh, screens and to screens that are wider than 768 pixels. So when you uh, put some CSS rules in there, they only apply to uh, devices that fill uh, that condition. So the media query is, is actually a sort of a conditional statement that you're uh, checking. Here's an example of a AND connector. Again, screens with a minimum width of uh, 768 pixels and landscape orientation. 
And, uh, I'm not going to show any more examples of these here. Uh, once you learn the basic syntax, it's uh, pretty easy to uh, combine these as you uh, like. And how can you use, uh, how can you link these into your project? There's uh, three ways of doing that. You can link them uh, directly, link the style sheets directly to uh, HTML's head section, as is done in the uh, demo site, if you look at the source. Or you can uh, embed media queries uh, directly into a style sheet. <laughs> uh, just as I showed in the examples. Or you can import other, uh, one style sheet into another, into the existing style sheet with the uh, import statement. So that's sort of like uh, chaining whole st uh, style sheets together. This is the basic uh, linking syntax uh, in an HTML head section. Nothing really complicated there. It's just got the media and the uh, media query within it. This is embedding into a style sheet, so it's just uh, creating a basic uh, block within the style sheet, defining uh, rules there. Then this is the importing bit. If the media query is true, we bring in that new style sheet here, which is uh, styles.css in this case. Is there really so? If you use the import, doesn't it already import the external style sheet also? Uh, where would you use it? In a CSS file or? Uh, yeah, if you, yeah, I totally use the CSS file. I think if you do it this way, uh, the condition must be true. Only then it gets uh, imported in there, or actually uh, becomes active. I'm not sure if it's uh, already uh, like loaded up there. Yeah, that was, that's what I meant. That it yeah. Makes a request and loads that already. Yeah. I'm not really uh, going to go deep into performance issues here. Uh, that's uh, something that would uh, take at least a couple hours more. But that's a good point. So uh, as always, uh, older browsers uh, usually cause uh, gray hairs. We have the uh, old versions of uh, Internet Explorer. For those, you can uh, use a couple of uh, JavaScript libraries that enable media queries for you if you want to do that. Or uh, another, I think, uh, a better solution is to use uh, IE's conditional statements. So you have those in your uh, HTML markup at the head, right after the uh, doc type declaration. And if the browser, for example, here, if the browser is uh, less than the IE9 in version, it adds a new class into HTML tag. So then you can target that tag in your styles and uh, provide sort of a reasonable fallback for uh, all older, older uh, Internet Explorers. And if you want to uh, know, uh, like, uh, based on every individual browser, if you can use media queries or not, there's a good site called uh, caniuse.com slash css-media queries. It's got a really neat table that shows uh, all the different browser versions and uh, browser manufacturers. It's a great tool. Actually, I don't think IE10 supports conditional statements anymore like that. I'm not sure about that. I haven't really played around with uh, IE10 uh, okay. that much. But um, that's what I heard. Just released yesterday or the day before, I think, all the platforms. And there were some issues when people were trying to uh, write style sheets just for it by using conditional style statements. Yeah, I'm not surprised there's uh, issues with IE. <laughs> 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 you can raise your hand if uh, IE is your favorite browser if you want to. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, then we're. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, fluid grids a bit. How many of you know uh, what a design grid is? 
couple of people. Good. It's uh, basically a tool that helps designers uh, bring in visual consistency into any document. And it, in print design, there's uh, the grid they use is it has both uh, horizontal and vertical columns. And what they do is uh, they add rhythm and order to stuff like uh, photos and uh, typography, textual elements, and so on. And it, it's a great tool in uh, providing uh, help for uh, inserting new elements or bringing in new uh, content into a document in a consistent manner. And like I said, it's, uh, it's used all over the place in print design. And if I can get the uh, demo site to show up here, there's a small grid toggle at the bottom. You can turn this uh, on if you want to look at how these uh, elements are laid out. If you got something with a better resolution than this, you, you're going to see uh, all these uh, images next to each other uh, horizontally. So then you'll uh, see even better how the grid works, but the uh, basic idea is this that Whenever you insert anything new here, you do it uh, within the grid's terms. So for example here, we have an image that takes up uh, six columns. And just uh, about the basics, these are called the columns and these are called the gutters. Those are the true uh, terms that you run into all the time with grids. So for a web project, there's a lot of uh, grid frameworks that you can use. There's a couple of them mentioned. I think I've seen at least 20, 30, something like that. And they're good for uh, speeding up, uh, speeding up uh, your prototype building when you're just uh, trying to create something quick. But there's a downside too. And that is that they, uh, if you're uh, aiming for semantically correct markup, they uh, add a lot of uh, extra clutter, usually via spans and uh, extra divs. But there's some uh, frameworks, I think uh, semantic.gs is something that tries to retain the uh, semantic uh, correct correctness in, uh, in the markup. But the fact is that grids aren't really that difficult to build manually. Uh, there's no point in uh, trying to worry about stuff like uh, vertical alignment as you would with uh, print design because uh, the nature of content on the web, it's, it's always shifting and changing. So here's something. Uh, this is actually a screenshot of the, uh, how those uh, images display. Like uh, when you're uh, going to resolutions above 1,000 and or width of uh, above 1,024 pixels, if I remember right, on the demo site. So uh, what I generally do is I create a, a wrapper div that has all the elements in it. For example, in this case, it's the uh, the width of the whole grid. Then I place the uh, I have an image of the grid that I uh, use as a reference and I place that as a background to the wrapper div. So, and I set the background size uh, property in CSS on the grid to contain. So the grid is always the same size as the uh, wrapper div. And then I start, when you resize the wrapper, uh, wrapper div, uh, the uh, grid image uh, resizes accordingly and you can start inserting uh, stuff there. And of course, you need to uh, define everything uh, proportionally. If you if you started defining uh, things in pixels, for example, the width of those uh, uh, three uh, images there, it, it would go wrong. You need to do it in uh, percentages. Uh, and finding out the percentages is easy. You just have the target, for example, the uh, image, which is uh, 300 pixels, when the grid is at max width. You divide that by the context width, with this, which is the uh, wrapper div, and multiply that by 100, and you get the uh, percentage that you can use in your uh, style sheet directly. With that approach, there's no uh, 
extra markup that you're creating. It's just a little bit more uh, manual work. But with uh, some CSS uh, free processors, you can create functions that do that processing for you. So you just have the uh, context width and the uh, target width as uh, parameters to that. For example, with uh, less or SAS. So uh, a good tip is to uh, try to use as few pixel values as possible, especially when dealing with grids. Margi uh, margins, paddings, and uh, widths, or basically anything related to uh, the box model is uh, something that you need to uh, pay attention to because uh, they will break your design if they're not in uh, proportional values really easily. And uh, when you uh, type some of that stuff into a calculator, you get really long decimal numbers, and it might make uh, be uh, all right to uh, leave those as they are because browsers, uh, they round numbers differently. For example, some versions of IE don't do any decimal rounding at all. They just cut them out. Uh, some browsers are really uh, accurate about them. Okay, but then uh, fluid images. This is an area that's uh, still the most problematic in uh, responsive design. Of course, um, our images need to be scaled too. And uh, there's, uh, as many of you probably know, there's two ways to use images. They're uh, inline images and via CSS uh, backgrounds. And there's a lot of uh, different hacks that include uh, HD access files, uh, backend components, uh, JavaScript, and whatnot, but nothing has been standard standardized yet in uh, responsive design images. And there's even a working group called Responsive Images Working Group, which is uh, working on a solution, but nothing has been uh, set in stone yet. So if you're uh, interested in uh, responsive images, that's a good place to uh, follow up on conversation. These are probably, if we're talking uh, CSS background images, these are the two, uh, uh, or this one property is the one thing that you'll uh, be using a lot, and which is uh, background size. And the two really uh, useful values here are contain and cover. If you're uh, using contain, the image is always set inside its parent container and there's no overflow at all. But usually the case is that you're gonna end up with some banding either on the side, empty space on the sides or uh, on top and bottom. The other option is to use the cover value, which uh, is how it is in the demo side too. If you uh, resize the browser, the uh, background image, sort of uh, parts of it disappear into the overflow area. So uh, with cover, the uh, parent container is uh, always filled and there is overflow. But the aspect ratio stays uh, all right with uh, both of these uh, solutions. Excuse me, do I get that wrong or is what was that image on the previous slide, the cover version, isn't that like wrong now? No, the... Uh, the dashed line is the the dashed line is the image. Uh, then, then it's not covering the parent element. Yeah, yeah, it's true above. Oh yeah. Right above yeah, yeah. The the uh, the labels are yeah, <laughs> the labels are wrong. Now, yeah. Now I, now I get it. I was. Yeah. Thanks for that. I'm confused. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah. But you got the idea that yeah. Okay. Anyway, here's. Uh, the property is just spelled out. And with uh, inline images, you can, uh, it's as simple as this. If you just have very large images that you need to scale down to the uh, parents width uh, or parent sites, or actually width, I think there's a typo too, I'm not sure. It might be, it should be max width. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
surprising. And they hide to auto, so uh, your image is always going to be the width of the parent this way. But the downside with this approach is that if you imagine that you have a layout that has a, like a, it's a one column layout, it's really wide. The images that you're uh, going to have to use with the inline uh, element are going to be really big. And then what, what you end up doing is uh, when you go into uh, mobile widths, like let's say 480 pixels, you're going to end up loading those same images even for your mobile device. So it's a really, uh, costs a lot of uh, long loading times, especially when you're on something like an edge network. And uh, this is one of the uh, most interesting uh, future solutions for uh, that has come out of uh, Responsive Images Working Group. It's a new uh, element, picture, where you could uh, use media queries and uh, define uh, resources to load up based on those media queries. So this seems uh, really promising, but it hasn't been decided on yet. Then a bit about the uh, workflow. This is uh, one of my favorite things about uh, responsive web design. It's uh, something that evolves sort of naturally, but there's uh, really good ideas put forward by guys like uh, Stephen Hay or Brian and Stephanie Rieger, and there's, uh, they have their presentations up on SlideShare if you want to Google those up. Uh, they're really good viewing or uh, reading material. So the old, old uh, workflow went something like this. You, uh, first you created pixel perfect layouts in Photoshop. You spent weeks in uh, fine tuning those and then you deliver your Photoshop files to developers. Once the client was happy of course in uh, the uh, developer sliced them up for you uh, to be used in HTML, or actually he created the HTML too. And uh, of course you may have needed to do this uh, cycle around several times. And the way things are done in uh, content management systems is that you always create the design first, then uh, inserting the content is the very last step in the process. So uh, if you think about the scenario where you have a responsive design, you design all the different widths in uh, Photoshop, and uh, your client wanted changes, you'd have to reflect those changes in uh, every single uh, like width variation. And it's a real-time sync and a, a really boring job for uh, any designer to do it that way. So we need a better solution for this. So what's the, uh, what's the first step in solving any problem? It's uh, admitting that you have one, of course. So uh, that's what the workflow aims at. But before, uh, before talking about that in more detail, I'd like to touch on a concept called uh, mobile first design. It's in a concept uh, uh, basically put forward by a guy called Luke Roblevsky in his book uh, by the same name, Mobile First. The idea is that instead of starting from the desktop and uh, shrinking down to mobile widths, you start from uh, the smallest mobile version. And that way you need to uh, focus on the important content first. You need to prioritize what is really important in your design. And what happens is you need to leave out all the extra clutter from your designs. So that way we get, the, uh, we get good support for devices with lesser capabilities. And uh, as we get, move on to larger screens like desktops and uh, laptops and so on, we can uh, progressively enhance them via JavaScript instead of doing a graceful degradation. 
And if you think this is something uh, that doesn't make any difference, just uh, think about the, uh, the amount of people who are using mobile phones for doing everything. It's uh, rising every day. And if you look at the uh, nature of design, it's, it really is problem solving based around the content. You shouldn't be generating the design first and then worrying about content. So the less clutter we have on the screen, the uh, more easier it will be for users to accomplish what they want to do. And uh, a guy called Dieter Rams, uh, who here has uh, heard about him, uh, Dieter Rams? Yeah, he's a guy who's uh, influenced uh, Jonathan Ives and Apple's designs uh, like in a really major way. He said that simplicity is the key to good design and that good design is uh, as little design as possible. And there's been uh, one really interesting uh, thing on the web for like forever. Is, and that is that people with uh, desktop PCs have a lot more screen real estate to use so we can give them more extra features, but why would we do that? Don't we want these uh, people to do their uh, tasks as well as uh, the guys who get the interfaces without clutter too? So we'll start off with uh, a content inventory. This step that, if you look at the traditional way of uh, handling these projects, is something that is missing. It's really missing. Uh, the content is only inserted into ready-made design. So we need a, a list of raw materials that we're working with. And uh, at this point, a lot of designers like to use lorem ipsum, but that's not really a good idea. You need to try to get your hands on uh, some real textual content. And that's enough at that point. Then we start doing textual design. We try to understand what the uh, content is about. And we're trying to establish a sort of a hierarchy that shows priorities. To find out more about this, we can look at the brand strategy or brand message, the corporation strategy that we're working for. We can look at traffic logs and uh, do observation, what is uh, important if it's an old site that we're working on or uh, re redesigning it. And the goal is to create a site, a really simply, a simple HTML page that just displays unstyled text, but displays the hierarchy anyways. Then on to uh, sketching. Uh, pen and paper uh, are really good tools for this. They're easy to use and you can use them anywhere. And there's also some good digital tools like uh, Balsamic Mockups, which is uh, a really cheap and uh, useful application for uh, creating sketches. That's uh, that sketch there is made with uh, Balsamic in like a minute. So. Uh, the aim for this sketching step is to uh, play around with uh, blocks and try to find visual support for the uh, textual hierarchy. And it's smart to try to think in minimal components here. So if you look at the, uh, the demo site, we got stuff like logo navigation, a product list, and uh, stuff, that, stuff that needs uh, to be sort of promoted in a very visible way. And at this point, it's also important to uh, try to stick to uh, normal interface design conventions. So uh, don't go overboard with uh, creating new uh, novel ideas. Then uh, moving on from this uh, sketch, we start creating a, a prototype. And uh, this uh, screenshot here is misleading. This is like after uh, several cycles of doing this, the actual first version, such as uh, HTML pages with uh, simple blocks and text, not much CSS styling to them. And this is uh, an example of mobile-first design. So we're uh, going with the 
the narrowest version first. It's easy to edit. We can uh, do changes there as quickly, pretty much as we could to uh, the mockups or the sketches. And there's some good tools available for this step uh, or for prototyping uh, in general. As, as I mentioned already, those uh, grid frameworks are really good. Uh, CSS preprocessors are good. There's uh, preprocessors like uh, Less and SAS and Compass, and uh, you can find uh, good reviews on those uh, from online. And these, uh, yeah, then. Uh, we haven't touched uh, any uh, breakpoint related stuff uh, related to media queries at all yet. So what we start doing next is uh, defining the breakpoints. And the easy way to do that is just open up your prototype in your browser, start stretching the layout, and when the uh, content starts looking really bad, you know, it might be a good time to insert a breakpoint there. Then, uh, in that image below there, if you look at the line length, it's uh, really unreadable, and the images are uh, too narrow. They're not filling up the uh, whole uh, width of the uh, design, so we might insert a breakpoint somewhere before that. And it's always uh, smart to think from about this step from uh, content outwards and not think of devices, so forget all about the uh, normal Apple breakpoints, always uh, focus on the content. And there's a, there's really no uh, perfect universal set of breakpoints, so it's, it's just uh, a matter of trial and error. This uh, tool presented by uh, Stephen Hay is a breakpoint graph. Uh, graph it's a uh, the image might be a bit blurry, but the idea is that this is something that you can uh, use to communicate your designs, uh, design decisions to the uh, rest of your uh, team or your clients. And it just uh, shows uh, what happens to the design in really a uh, rough way. You have the uh, breakpoints defined and the pixel values, and then you can include uh, other stuff there like what sort of input device the designs that those uh, specific uh, breakpoints are probably using. After that mobile first, uh, really simple prototype, you can start uh, sketching your breakpoints and think about what happens when you reach a breakpoint? How does it affect positioning of the elements or, or the order of the elements and their visibility? Again, think from content out. If, if you have elements that jump from side to side, does the content still make sense? Or is the hierarchy that you created in the beginning, is it still there and is it easy to read and recognize? Then I go on to updating your prototype. based on the sketches in your earlier work and pay attention to stuff like uh, type face size, uh, the measure, which is the uh, length of uh, one line of text. A good value is to aim for 50 to 80 characters per line. If it gets longer than that, you need to do something because it becomes more difficult and tiresome to read. Also, uh, touch target sizes are important in small resolutions. The, uh, keep in mind that your link can be bigger than the actual visible target there. And the deliverable from this uh, step is the working HTML uh, document. You can forget all about uh, Photoshop files. But you need to design in browser and think fluidly. But you can still use Photoshop just for creating uh, individual components small things like logos or images or uh, image gradients or gradients or buttons stuff like that but forget using about photoshop for any uh, layout related stuff then this is a step that 
you can't really uh, skip. <laughs> Try to find real dev devices to test on. Everybody's got friends who got different devices, and uh, most companies have uh, at least a few devices to use. And there's even uh, talk about creating open labs. I think there's one in Helsinki created by a guy called uh, William Salmin, if I remember right. He's uh, starting up an open labs device testing uh, laboratory of some sort. And when, when you're testing, forget about minor variations and all sorts of uh, rendering issues, because uh, trying to make everything pixel perfect is going to drive you crazy in the end. It's, it's a never ending road trying to create all of those. And if something seems wrong, you go back to uh, sketching, updating your prototype. You, you just uh, rinse and repeat this cycle until uh, everything looks good. This is another idea from Stephen Hay about presentation um, of your material or your prototype to client. So what you want to do is you want to underline that it's a process that, and that changing stuff shouldn't look too easy. So even if you got a working prototype, you want to uh, take screenshots of it and present those to the client one by one. Like uh, you present one really rude screenshot, then then the client asks for changes. A couple of weeks go by, you present another one, and finally you present the uh, working prototype that the uh, client get can uh, start using and playing around with. Then on to uh, documentation. How many of you are uh, developers who just, uh, or how many of you slice up uh, uh, Photoshop files in your work, like daily? That's, uh, that's probably something that developers really hate doing. And in the worst cases, uh, those files you end up working with aren't even Photoshop documents that you can actually get good measures from, but they can be something like PDF, and your uh, values are all defined in X's and 2X's and 4X's and so on. <laughs> so uh, a good documentation is really valuable to developers and then to deliverable to them. Because we're designing a system with components, we can uh, document all the components, of course. So how would we uh, generate a style guide? This is an example from a GitHub style guide. A guy called uh, Kyle Neath has uh, created a pretty good solution for this called the Knile Style Sheets, which uh, is a tool that reads uh, comments from CSS and uh, creates documentation based on those comments. And this is uh, generated with the uh, Knile Style Sheets. And it's uh, easy pretty automated way of uh, maintaining a nicely formatted documentation. So, the role of the designer, in my opinion, it's something that's uh, the traditional role is going out the window. Like uh, designers now and into in the future, they're going to be guys who uh, who know both uh, technical development and uh, design, because design and tech development go hand in hand, not one after the other, as happened before. So we, uh, it's a good idea to forget about those old roles. And uh, design. Ha oh. Now, design always happens in browser. I can't remember the last time I've actually used uh, just Photoshop for creating the whole design. And if you think about job opportunities, uh, learning to design in browser is a competitive advantage. Photoshop designers are going to be guys who are working with print a lot in, uh, very soon. So uh, the people who are most sought after, in my opinion, are uh, people with uh, versatile skills. Don't get 
locked into uh, one niche uh, too much. And responsive uh, web design in general, it's uh, it's only a couple of years old as a concept, and it's uh, it's still in sort of a late infancy, but it's becoming more more and more accepted. And I think mobile sites are uh, also something a uh, relic of the past, uh, really soon, something that is sustained by salespeople. So. Uh, You might be thinking uh, when it's a good idea to use responsive uh, web design and when not to. As always in web design, it's, it depends. There's no silver bullets. So go case by case and use common sense. And if it's a new site, I'd say go for it unless you've got a really good reason not to. That reason might be budgets or uh, you may be uh, aiming just for a really specific group of uh, professional people who never uh, use mobile devices in that environment for some reason. If it's an old site, it's going to be really tricky and you might want to uh, try to extend your, uh, or at least double your deadlines. <laughs> so uh, overall, I think a responsive web design is uh, is the uh, at least one of the steps into better and more usable uh, design and more thrilling design and overall better user experiences.